host Jay Farr at Tech Fusion Systems. Our guest is Marty Gilbert, founder and CEO at North Shore Executive Networking Group. Marty, welcome to the podcast. Right. Thanks for having me. So, Marty, can you start us out and tell us a little bit about North Shore Executive Networking Group and what you guys do? Sure. The group is really intended for anybody who's in a job search or anybody who's not happy with their current employment situation. It's an organization I started about 14 years ago. I was in a job search at the time. And the fact is that there's a lot of people that come and go in job searches. I started it with a group of about six folks and it grew to 12 and 25 and 50. I landed my next job rather quickly. And I attribute that in large part to my sales and marketing background, but I kept the group going and just moved all of our events and meetings and conversations to the evening. What I started to do as the group started to continue to grow is I started to formalize things. I started bringing in outside speakers. I started doing some job search coaching of my own in my off hours. And quite honestly, what started with a group of about five or six of us today is getting very close to almost 11,000 members. We're the largest job search organization in the United States. I've got three new members joining the group every day, but I have at least one new member landing a job every day as well. And to me, that's one of the most important barometers. Even though we've got very low unemployment in this country, there's a lot of great talent that's out of work. And unfortunately, it can hit anybody at any point in time. And a big part of what I do is I provide people with the tools on how to land their next job a lot quicker. And of course, when the pandemic hit, I became a global business overnight, reaching a lot of folks in different industries and different job functions and employing some of my unique processes in the process to help them land a lot faster. And we're going to talk about some of your unique, your the unique way that you guys go about doing this. And how long ago did you start this? Yeah, about 14 years ago. 14 years. Um, and again, it was it started off first as an accountability group, just to get a, a bunch of a small group of us together to talk about how our searches were going and what we can do to help one another. And I encourage everybody to have a small group of folks that you can turn to when you're in a job search to help one another. I think it's, I think it's important. But as things got bigger, I could see what well, I need to put a little bit more formality into this. And it really helped when I started organizing webinars and three-hour workshops and putting out a newsletter every week. And, and those kinds of things helped make the organization grow that much faster because the word now was getting out in a big way. And of course, my digital, ba digital marketing background really helped a great deal because I knew how to get from one to many people without having to put in a, a replicatable process that you have to keep copying and pasting all over the place. The, the digital marketing aspect of the way we market companies today is just so powerful. And it's been a big part, of, I believe, of my success. Gotcha. And you started this because you were looking for employment at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for anybody starting up a business, there, there are obviously a lot of basic things that we need to go through in identifying the need and market demand and what kind of verticals and various target audiences you're going after. But it really helps if you've been through the product or service that you yourself are trying to market. And that's where I have a huge leg up. I've been through multiple job searches myself, sometimes of my own choosing, sometimes not. But I really identify with the audience that I serve because I've been one of them. And I know the peaks and valleys of the job search, the, the emotional, unfortunate, the, the emotional drain that goes on within the individual and those around them. And trying to get a great job is one thing. But the other thing is, how do I get that great job as quickly as possible? Because mm -hmm. it can take a tremendous toll on an individual mm -hmm. and their family in the process. Right. Yeah, it's been a long time since I was in the job search market, but I do remember doing it multiple times. And it certainly is quite a process. And like you said, you don't know how long it's going to take or when the right opportunity is going to come along or if you should settle or if you should hold out. It's, there's a lot going on there. And boy, it, it certainly was never a very straightforward process for me. You get different answers from the employers. Oh, we need someone right now. Oh, you're perfect. We'll call you next week. Two months later, you're still waiting. And so, it, yeah, you're right. It can be a bit of a roller coaster. 
So real quick, I want to touch on when you were last looking for employment, you started this whole thing up. What, what professions were you in previously? Yeah, my background in large part is marketing, sales, and general management. I started out my career in advertising. I, I worked for an ad agency in Chicago, but a year later, I found myself moving to Japan. The largest advertising agency in the world is a Japanese firm by the name of Dentsu. When I went to work for Dentsu, they had 6,000 employees, but only five of us were not Japanese. And they had five writers in their world headquarters in Tokyo. Now, as you can imagine, Tokyo is a pretty amazing city, about 25 million people. But back when I lived there, there were very few foreigners. And, and here I was working in a company for the purpose of helping some of the largest multinational firms in the world to export their products to the United States, Europe, other parts of Asia, and Latin America. And so I had I helped introduce to the world products like the Sony Walkman, the VCR, the microwave oven, of course, Toyota, Nissan, Honda, they were all clients of ours, all the camera companies, Mitsubishi, Matsushita, Hitachi, Toshiba. Wow, it, those oh, are some wow. huge trends. That's a huge wow. amount of product that came in. And it was fantastic. Really neat gadgets too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I was, I was always telling my friends back in the States, you can't believe some of the products coming out of Japan. Ja that Japanese probably... engineering is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and everything was so miniaturized, the size of cameras, the size of, of course, the automobiles with tremendous quality in mind. And I saw J in Japan take that quality turn during the time that I was there. And of course, everything that I wrote appeared in international magazines, Time, Newsweek, Fortune, Business Week, National Geographic. There was no internet, and they used us primarily for print media. But boy, did I build up a great portfolio. And people, of course, could see my work all over the world about some of the things and the excitement that was coming out of Japan, because it was pretty phenomenal. And of course, everything that I wrote was in English, and it stayed in English. But for the most part, everybody I worked with was Japanese and Japanese was their first language. And some of them selectively spoke some English, but we had translators that, that were translating for us on our presentations to clients exactly what's behind the double meanings and some of the slogans that we were writing for various products that were going global. So it was, I can't say enough about the company Dentsu. It was phenomenal. They took really good care of me and the other foreigners in the firm. And it was a great learning experience. And it's the kind of company, particularly back then, that if you got into a place like Dentsu, because it was such a prestigious firm, you'd stay there for life. Lifetime employment was associated with companies like this. And you can understand why they were the best at everything they did and have continued to flourish in the years that followed. Yeah, that's super interesting. That must have been a pretty incredible experience. It was. I'll tell you one interesting note is that I played a lot of baseball while I was in Japan. I was a pretty good ball player here in the States, but I got really active in baseball and softball while I was in Japan. And the Japanese are absolutely crazy about baseball. It's that and sumo wrestling. I'm mean, probably buying <laughs> for the most popular sport in the country. But I had an opportunity to represent Japan on their national all-star softball team. And they took representatives from Japan, one from Japan Airlines, Mitsubishi, Matsushita, yeah, and other large firms. And I got selected from this American team. And then we toured around Southeast Asia to play other Asian teams. Just a, again, fantastic experience. And the style of baseball in Japan is quite different from here in the States. But as you can see, there's an influx of Japanese and Korean ballplayers that have come into the United States that have done quite well. And so the, the level of, of skill in the country has really gotten in, incredibly better. Than yeah. the one That's of, interesting. Like, I've never seen them play. I actually didn't know that, but I've always found Japan very interesting though, for yeah. a lot of reasons. Let's talk about your products and services and what you offer to your members and how you help people in the job search and maybe what sets you apart from some other firms out there. I know there's a lot of exposure of people that are that talk about doing this or offering these types of services, job placement, interview prep, training, all those sorts of things. So what do you guys do? And like, how do your customers take advantage of all the services that you have to offer to land them the best opportunity for them? Now, I can tell you right up front, what probably is very distinguishing characteristic about me and my background versus other people that are in the job search space 
is that I don't come out of HR or talent recruitment. And that gives me a huge advantage because in large part, my background is marketing. And 90% of the job search is about marketing. It's positioning, packaging, messaging, targeting, engaging your audience, and then ultimately launching an outbound marketing campaign to help promote you as a new product in the marketplace because people don't know who you are for the most part. And to me, people can't get that from folks unless you've got a coach who has a very strong and solid marketing background and somebody who's launched new products. And that has been a huge part of my background. And unfortunately, 90, I don't know, pick a number, 98, 99% of most of the job search coaches don't have the marketing background. And I get a lot of folks that have been working with a coach and they migrate over to me because they're just not getting what they feel they need to help distinguish them in the marketplace. And so we go through all of the aspects that you would with any new product launch. Now there's, so the coaching is the biggest piece of my business, but we have a lot of other services around what NSENG does that really were the foundation of the, of this business. Uh, it was networking meetings. I've got webinars that are essentially two hours in length that are, I've got an event going on this basically every three weeks. And it's either a two hour webinar where I've picked a topic or a three hour workshop. They both are very instructional. It's very hands-on. And my pro approach is not to be somebody who stands on the sidelines and just gives advice from time to time. I'm giving very specific actions that people need to think about, and I'm telling them how to build out their job search experience, whether it's how to optimize your LinkedIn profile for search engines, how to build out an applicant tracking system version of your resume, how to network more effectively, how to really use the LinkedIn platform because the average job seeker doesn't understand a lot of the features true. that are out there. Yeah, definitely you know? true. How do yeah. I cover letters? So many people don't write cover letters. And to me, it has power that a resume and a LinkedIn profile will never have because the cover letter enables you to connect the dots between your background and key requirements of the job. And a lot of job seekers don't do them because they tell me it takes them two to three hours to customize each one. And for them, I've got a great answer because I've developed a way in which you can write highly tailored <clears throat> email cover letters in less than 10 minutes. And that obviously captures a lot of people's interests. And I tell them, I said, resumes tell, but cover letters sell. Yeah. And you got to be selling. That makes sense because it's yeah. more of story format, whereas a resume is more factual bullet point formatted. So yeah, yeah. facts tell and stories sell. That's old marketing. That's interesting that you mentioned that you don't come primarily from like HR because I know when I was in the job search market and I was in corporate America with a lot of colleagues and friends, there always seemed to be a really big disconnect between like the HR and the job placement people that work in the middle of the applicants and then the people that you're actually going to work for. Do you find that to be true? Absolutely. <clears throat> and it can be very frustrating for a job seeker. This is why I tell people and a lot of folks that I've coached, I've seen this, they've applied online to an advertised position. They've gotten a rejection email through the HR department or through the applicant tracking system within 15 or 20 minutes. And I've still been able to get them interviews because we go around these systems. You should be going directly to the decision makers. It's the hiring manager. It's that person's peers, because oftentimes it's not just one person who's a part of the interview process. And if they've got a boss and you need to be marketing yourself to all of those folks. And that's why I say the outbound marketing campaign is really the engine behind getting visibility for you as an individual who brings value. And if you don't have enough keyword matches in your resume or your LinkedIn profile, oftentimes you're going you're gonna to get no visibility through applicant tracking systems. But I tell people, you shouldn't be empowering. It. Those are just a piece of software. They don't have the intuition that an individual does. And that's why you got to get to the people who have the power who own the budget and they have the ability to make decisions. And that's not a piece of software. Right. And so my approaches are, are quite different, but I can tell you they, they are very effective because we cut through a lot of the timeline and we cut through the fact that sometimes the best applicants never get any visibility whatsoever. And I've right. seen this, a lot of great people don't get interviews 
because they've either come too late into the process or they just never got the engagement or visibility with the right audience. I've always noticed that's one of the, I could say this about a, a lot of industries, but it, I definitely noticed a lot of spam tactics being used in either the, we need to hire someone or I'm looking for a job. Like you said, they don't bother to do cover letters. They don't put in the time to make physical human connections with the decision makers through other mechanisms above and beyond just posting the resume into the job forum database or whatever. And so it sounds like you're taking a very, like a high value approach to this instead of the let's spam everyone in the world and see what shakes out yeah. approach, which I don't think is very good. Yeah. Think about it. We're all bombarded by TV ads every day. And one of the advantage, <clears throat> the advantages that any company that's trying to sell products is that you can see 30 second spots every 15 minutes for the same product. But when you're a job seeker, you don't get that many bites at the apple. You can't be constantly reaching out to the same people time and time again, which means the word that you put down on paper, the words that you put down online, the words that come out of your mouth have got to be extremely powerful and attention getting from the very beginning, because you may have only one opportunity to let people know why you're the right person for this job that they're trying to fill. And so I tell people the written word is, is so critical and not everybody is a great writer. I think I'm fortunate that I grew up in the writing field and it has of course served me so well throughout my career and every job that I've had. But it's important to be able to grab people's attention because the average resume only gets six to 10 seconds of read time. Yeah. How much can anybody read in six to 10 seconds? Yeah. So that, that The stuff has got to pop off the page. I know there's these, you can call them AI systems, but there's auto detection systems too, where no one ever reads the resume. You get a response in like 15 seconds denied one of your key terms to match or right. who knows. Yeah, it's crazy. I definitely agree. It's the same in kind of the lead gen world, the lead generation world. You have a certain base of potential customers. And if your messaging is really bad, they don't like you now and you burn up your audience. So same as when you're looking for a really great employment opportunity, you only have so many opportunities that are available and you want to be really careful about coming out strong and with authority and high value right out of the gate so that you don't burn that up and ruin that potential opportunity. So that makes perfect sense to me. What, what has been your main driver in growing this group and acquiring members and growing so large? I've gone at it through a multi-channel marketing approach. I myself am very active on LinkedIn. I joined LinkedIn back in 2004. I've got over 29,000 LinkedIn connections, and I don't know 28,000 of those people, but that's okay because I'm connected to a lot of people that can give me visibility. When I go on to LinkedIn looking for job seekers, for example, I'm, I can find them a lot easier than the average person because I can look for certain keywords. I know how to use the, the filtering process in LinkedIn. And so my ability to find people that are the, the job seekers out there is not all that difficult. But another important piece is creating more and more visibility for NSENG and myself. I do a lot of public speaking. I do free LinkedIn live sessions every few weeks, whether it's a Q&A session or it's a webinar. And I'll get anywhere from 400 to 1400 people registering for these sessions that I'm putting on. And to me, that's free advertising. I'm sharing information that can be very helpful for people. And some of these people are going to end up joining my group. Some of them might start purchasing some of the workshops or webinars or my coaching services. I also do a lot of public speaking at not only my own group, but other job search groups and large university alumni groups. I'm more interested in the alumni of universities as opposed to those that are part of the student body because the alumni associations are so much bigger. And so I have spoken on job search topics to many alumni associations, including schools like Harvard, Yale, Cornell, University of Michigan and Chicago, Miami of Ohio. There's a group of about 15 of them across the country, NYU and Howard University. What it does, it helps ensure that I've got a constant influx of very high qualified people 
coming into the organization. And so I can always assure people that are already members that you're going to be networking with some very talented people that are well connected. And at the same time, I'm posting onto LinkedIn probably on average about three times a week. And I get a lot of impressions and I get a lot of, more importantly, the engagement I get with people that are viewing my short video snippets or some of the things that I'm writing on different job search topics. To me, that's great because the moment people start to comment on things that I'm saying, everybody who's connected to them is getting a, a brief alert saying that so-and-so just commented on a mm -hmm. post from Marty Gilbert. And so it, again, the digital nature of our environment today, it I can put out a post a couple times a week and it can get out to tens of thousands of people over time. And to me, that's a real good use of my time, but I'm also sharing some pretty valuable advice. I was going to say that you're obviously putting out very high value content that is useful to people. And that's why as long as your content is of value to people, you're going to get a lot of traction. So you're obviously doing a really good job with that. And would you say LinkedIn is your primary membership acquisition yeah. channel? Yeah, it's one of, it's probably one of two. I do get a lot of referral business. I get a lot of people who will email me and say, hey, has mentioned you and your group to me and said it would be a great place for me to, to learn about expediting my job search. I've just been let go. So I do get a lot of referral business from folks and people that, you know, that want to join. And you're right about the content on LinkedIn. I, I do get a lot of visibility of new members coming into the group through the things that I do on LinkedIn. And of course, I've got newsletters that are going out every week and they have the ability to be shared with hundreds of people. While I send them to my 11,000 members, it could be getting to multiples of those numbers by virtue of people simply forwarding them on to several others that they think could use a hand in a search that maybe they're just starting on or that they've been frustrated with for quite some time. LinkedIn is absolutely a great platform. Now, I will tell you one thing that I noticed about LinkedIn is that everything I post on LinkedIn is job search related. Uh, and because that's to me is filling a great need. It's an area that I bring a lot of expertise and experience, but I do see a lot of people on LinkedIn that are posting simply about things in their social life that are not business related. And I've seen this migration of change take place in LinkedIn over the last couple of years in particular, because people are striving to get more and more impressions. And they think if they talk about themselves a lot, that's going to draw a lot more traffic to them because they make themselves more, they think their audience can identify with them. And I, I just don't take that approach. My feeling is yeah. there are a lot of people out there in need. I want to speak to that specific need, whether it's a lot of people or it's a select and narrow audience. To me, that's more valuable. Yeah, I agree. It's okay to do a little bit of that if you want to, if that's your thing, but definitely a very small amount. And especially on LinkedIn, like, because different people behave differently on different platforms. They go there for different reasons and they expect a different experience. And on LinkedIn, it's very business and value driven. It's not so much the personal part, but I do notice people sharing some personal stuff here or there. It's not really my thing. I'm down to business when I'm there, but it's okay if it's just a little bit, but yeah, I totally agree. Stick to business and, but still be a person too, but just don't make that your main thing. Cause yep. I don't really care what your dog had for breakfast. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Cool. And what's your, so what's your top of the funnel offer for people? Like people are like, Hey, you have good content. I think I need help. What do I do? Yeah. Like, do I go and join your membership first? Is that the first thing that people do? Is there a cost? Is it all free or is it some of it free? And then if someone, and then the next question is going to be, if I really need help finding the best employment opportunity, what services can you offer me then? Sure. There's no specific order to the way people can get engaged with the group. Okay. A lot of people want to become, want to become members first. Now the membership's free. Th this is an easy decision. And with the free membership, and you just go to my website, it's nseng.inc.com. You'll click it on there. You'll see the membership is free. And with that, of course, you can start now networking with our 11,000 members, but you're going to get two free webinar recordings from me immediately. 
everybody who becomes a mem member gets their own My NSENG webpage. And sitting in your webpage are going to be two 30-minute webinar recordings for me with a lot of very tactical job search advice. So to me, there, there's no reason not to become a member. It doesn't come with any catches. There's no caveat or any hidden costs. Now, once you're a member, you can get as involved in the group as you want, okay? You can purchase these two-hour webinars, and I've got 17 of them on all different job search topics, anything, LinkedIn, resumes, interviewing, networking, brain training. I've got an executive brain coach who talks about how to really stimulate your brain so that you can perform at a much higher level during job interviews. And so 17 different topics, and then I've got three-hour workshops. One is my trademark, what the hell approach to job search. I applied with the U.S. Patent Department for a trademark and received one about six years ago. The premise behind this, interestingly enough, is what the hell do you have to lose by doing things that other job seekers aren't doing? And so many job seekers are doing exactly the same thing. And when you do that, your odds of landing an advertised job are typically about 100 to 1. And my feeling is I've got 13 what the hell moves that you can deploy tomorrow that can get you a lot more visibility and a lot more traction in the marketplace and thereby shorten your job search, right. get you more interviews, so, a lot of things you want. So that doing. kind of brings it all together. And I wanted to ask you about, because right on your homepage is the what the hell approach to job search. Yeah. <laughs> and I immediately was like, I want to know what this is. And I think that's awesome because you're basically telling people that the majority of people are going about it the wrong way. And this is the right way to go about it. And... And the whole theme is the what the hell approach means what? Why the hell not do the things that other yeah, people yeah, aren't right. doing to set yourself apart, right? Yeah, absolutely. Whatever you got to lose by doing things that a lot of the other job seekers aren't doing, okay? And the average job seeker is spending a lot, an inordinate amount of their time answering online ads, to which I say, what are you doing with the other 90% of your week? Because it should never take up more than 10 or 15% of your job search time. And unfortunately, it does tend to monopolize people's time. But of course, we know that 70%, at least, of all the jobs that are acquired involve some level of networking, an introduction that you otherwise wouldn't get. But what's interesting is not more than 15% of all the jobs that are hired come as a result of an online ad. So think of that. A lot of advertised jobs out there on Indeed and LinkedIn and ZipRecruiter yeah. and CareerBuilder and sites like that. But a very small percentage of the actual hiring that takes place is because of those ads. And to which I say, you know what? You need to be building advocates inside companies. You need to be finding ways to get introduced into people that are in the sphere of influence that can help get you visibility. And that's why having a lot more LinkedIn connections can be so valuable because those secondary connections can, can get to be very large numbers. And you'll be amazed at, I tell people that when you look back at your job search and you're all done, you're gonna find that the conduit to your next job is likely to come through networking. And oftentimes it will come from somebody you did not know before you started your job search. Somebody who was a complete stranger to you. And to me, that's the power of networking because it's these degrees of separation that get you to the end destination and the job search and career development is not a straight line. Yeah, I was just gonna say like, it doesn't seem like it has changed all that much from Quite a long time ago, the last time I got a corporate job, I worked at it as a full-time job. It was my full-time job to get a job. And I got a good job, but it was not straightforward. It's not just submitting your resume in a cover letter. It's a whole thing. Connecting with people, asking for connections, asking other people to make introductions, on and on. So I think it's great that you have this website and this membership where people can go. And you can unravel all of that and just tell people, hey, these are the things you need to do. This is how you need to do it to maximize their chance of success of getting a really good placement. And on that note, have you had to adapt You've been in this game for quite a long time. Have you seen any major trends and changes you've had to adapt to over the years, or is it pretty much the same? And what kind of new trends do you see coming in the job seeking employment market? I think one of the big changes is just is the whole digital thing. So much of what we're finding to be effective is 
If you can get effective with digital marketing, the chances of you getting more connectivity into firms of interest to you is going to go up significantly. We do see a lot of companies out there that have difficult time making hiring decisions. And, and an event that I'm doing in a couple of weeks is all about how do you overcome ghosting? Okay. And you alluded to this earlier. It's not unusual for people to go through two, three, five, four, five rounds of interviews sometimes, and then to hear nothing. And I have found that to be an escalating process. Very frustrating for job seekers. No it's question. It's horribly unprofessional, I might it's, say. It's very unprofessional. And unfortunately, I don't see it decreasing. And the sad thing is that so many companies have applicant tracking systems today that can automatically send out rejection emails. Okay. So for those firms in particular, there's virtually no excuse for not just sending out an email telling people, I'm sorry, you just weren't a fit. But when yeah, people I, I think it's poorly executed to to yeah. do that. And just I didn't mean to interrupt there, but I was on a webinar from a very large consulting firm. They actually consult on the employer's side to improve their skills and their success at hiring the right people. And there's been studies done in the US, the success rate of hiring employees is around 50%, meaning 50, yeah. one out of two people work out. So yeah. I'd say that there's work to be done. Yeah, there. you raise a great point because when you hire the wrong employee, it's very costly. It's very expensive. Very expensive, yeah. You've invested Let's just pick a conservative. Because if you do it once, it's not once. It's a whole bunch of times. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you spend three months looking for the person. You spend another two to three months with them getting comfortable in the job, only to then find out, you know what, they're not the right person. And then you're starting all over again mm -hmm. and looking. I think that that's one reason why I think a lot of companies are very indecisive oftentimes in being able to pull the trigger when they've got some great candidates down to the final two or three. You, you asked about some of the trends that I have seen. Of course, one of the big trends that we have seen over the last few years with, with COVID in our lives is the whole idea of working remote. All right. Now, and I do a lot of polls on LinkedIn and I, I ran a poll about a month ago. And I believe the question I asked was all things being equal. If you had your choice, would you want to work 100% remote a hybrid situation where you're two to three days in an office or 100% in the office? The answer was 50% of the people said they want to work 100% remote. 45% said they'd be open to a hybrid situation and only 5% said, I want to be in the office all the time. Yeah. As a result, a lot of companies are going to have to get a lot more flexible and I see it with their offers to individuals, but I do see from time to time really good, talented people deciding to leave their firms because the firm has now said, you know what, we want everybody to come back in the office three days a week, five days a week. And some people have gotten accustomed to this capability to have more flexibility in their lives. And many people have found that they're more productive working from home. Sure. They don't have that hour commute in each direction, yeah. all that stress. You have to pack your lunch, you have to put on a suit, whatever it is. Yeah, you have to get out to the car, you got to fill it with gas, you got to stop at the gas station, you're stuck in traffic, What, whatever. Yeah, it's very expensive. It's very yeah. expensive. We're going to uh, see a lot of people, particularly job seekers, who are now going to have more choices. They have more choices today because certain jobs can remain remote or there, there might be flexibility that you live in Houston, but the jobs in LA, okay, you know what? Come to LA once a month for two days. Great. Most people are willing to do that. But I think that for those companies that take a very hard line on, hey, everybody's got to be in the office every day, they may suffer a bit with some really good individuals leaving because they know they can get opportunities where employers are going to be a lot more flexible with them. Gotcha. Yeah, I, and I see that trend as, as well a lot. Like I said, during COVID, obviously, it was like you had to do it. And then once people had that freedom and the employers figured it out, and a lot of people realized like this actually works really well anyway. And so, yeah, I do see a lot of that. And yeah, it definitely seems like a big trend. And like we like all of our people work remotely. It works really well for us. I think there's just a different management like a different form of management that you have to take on remote workers versus in the office. 
workers, but it's almost the same, really. And yeah. uh, you're missing the camaraderie and the FaceTime. And there's a lot to be said for FaceTime in a work environment. Just the opportunity for people to to see each what each other. But it doesn't have to be every day. Hybrid thing can be a very effective working model. I think for a lot of young people in particular who started out their careers during COVID, this has been a very tough experience because many of them have been working in a company where they have seen little to no people in person. And for that to be your first experience in a corporate environment can be really tough to try and identify with that culture of the company when everybody is remote. So I can absolutely see the value and do see the value in, in having FaceTime. But I think there is a happy medium here that companies can offer through hybrid models that I, I think will become the model for a lot of companies going forward. It sounds like that's, there's a lot of opportunity there to be more competitive if you were to do two things, right? Improve your hiring process if it's awful. That's enormous. Not only is it costly to do it poorly, but it's very advantageous to do it well. And then the hybrid location model, you need less real estate, a lot, much lower cost. So it makes a lot of sense to me, but okay, here's a good question. What piece of advice or what pieces of advice would you give to other entrepreneurs looking to succeed that you wish you would have known when you started? I, I did have an advantage <clears throat> over a, a, probably a lot of entrepreneurs, particularly solopreneurs, in that I had this strong foundational marketing and business development background. And so advice that I would have for anybody who's looking to get a new business going, you got to have a business plan. Okay. And I'm not saying it's got to be a 50 page document. Right. But you've got to be able to detail out what is the potential P&L projection for this business, okay? What kind of top line revenue do I think I can ge generate over time? And you're going to do it month to month. It's going to be your best guess. What are all the expenses associated with me running this business initially? And they would, if you're growing, those are going to increase with time. But what's your sales strategy? Okay. Is it direct selling? Is it selling through channel partners? Is it selling online? Is it, and of course the marketing channels and the marketing campaign that you put together, how are you getting the word out? You mentioned about lead generation, lead generation, sales prospecting, and looking for a job all share so much in common. Yeah, they do. Because we're trying to create opportunities in every one of those three areas. And for anybody who's in a job search, that's something that's got to be top of mind. The other thing for anybody who's starting up a business, I would say, you know, you got to get comfortable with doing things for the first time. And it's easy for us to gravitate to the things that we've always done because we think we do them really well. But there's no one single right way of getting the job done. And one of the toughest things for people that are starting up their own business is that they may be subject matter experts in whatever it is they do, whether it's a product or a service, but everybody needs to get comfortable becoming a salesperson, a really effective salesperson. Right. Because if you're not growing your revenue, you're not growing that top line. It doesn't matter how efficient your cost containment is. You can't is. have a business if you don't sell anything, yeah. can you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got it's to tough. <laughs> yeah, has that instinct in them, okay? But you can become a really good salesperson. It's just, you know, you may need a little coaching, but you've got to be really effective in communicating the value of what it is that you have to offer and what is the impact, the positive impact on the audience that you're trying to reach. Sure. Awesome. And you taught me and you also mentioned before, it's very helpful to do something that you have a good amount of experience in too. And now you're saying it's also important to be able to learn new things along the way because you're going to have to. So yeah, yeah, awesome advice. How do people get started with your, with your coaching and your material? How do people start getting help looking for the next opportunity or just preparing for when that time comes? Um, you're on LinkedIn, you're doing lots of LinkedIn lives, free content. <laughs> and also your website members. How do people, where do people go to, to do all that? Yeah, I urge people just email me at mgilbert at nsenginc.com, okay? Go to our website, join the group. It's free, nsenginc.com. Take a look at my LinkedIn profile 
and ring the bell up at the top of my LinkedIn profile. And then you'll be notified every time I publish something out on the LinkedIn platform. And take a look at my YouTube channel as well. And I've got a lot of recordings sitting up there. They're all free. And within the NSENG website, I have a lot of interviews that I've done with radio and TV broadcasters, other podcasters. Again, you'll get a lot of great information. You'll get a perspective that may in some cases be different from what you're hearing from other people. And that's okay. Again, there's no one right way to get to your next job search. But I can tell you, if you are not taking a marketing approach, it's going to probably take a bit longer because you've got to get that visibility that you probably deserve and may not be getting. And feel free to reach out to me via email if you're considering the possibility of working with a coach. I do free exploratory coaching calls to see where it is you need help and how I can help you. And I can tailor the services to anything you might need. And I have coaching packages that you can purchase right on the website. Now, we've got an e-commerce website where you can buy webinar recordings, you can buy workshop recordings, you can buy job search coaching packages, or if you want something one-on-one -on -one where I'm doing all the work for you, just email me and we'll schedule a time to talk. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Marty. So just so everyone knows, find him on LinkedIn. That's Marty Gilbert, nsenginc.com. A really good website. Everything, you can find everything right on the homepage, right across the top there. So find him on LinkedIn, get on one of his lives and get the best employment opportunity that's out there for you. Marty, so much for sharing your story and uh, giving everyone great information here. I hope uh, everyone's going to go and follow you and join your free membership group. Well, thanks for being thanks here. So yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity.